Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Bruce Broussard, Oregon Voters Digest. And today what we're going to do, we're going to present to you, we're going to go back in time, if you will, give you a feel of what history was during the Abraham Lincoln Day. There were issues about, uh, that are even to this date, that we're still c confused with. And I'm talking to uh, some of the issue of race, some of the issues of, uh, that we are constantly bombarded with today, and then again, like I said, it's race, I'm just being a little redundant, but um, I think we're going to have a solution here, and I think the solution is in this individual that's visiting us here in the state of Oregon, his name is Mike Zach, he's sort of an, a historian on the whole issue of Lincoln, and I even was somewhat surprised to, uh, to go back in time through Mike Zach and the publication of his book, Back to, back to the Basics, very interesting piece, Back to Basics for the Republican Party. And a lot of times, uh, I think, as I read the book, uh, the whole issue of partisanship first aroused. But then when I got into the book, it really was American history. And when you look at it from that particular perspective, you can get a better view of what we as Americans are all about and why it's so important that we understand this history so we can solve some of the issues that we have today. So the presentation today is to basically take you back in time and hopefully open up your mind and, uh, and, and, and you too will probably appreciate what this book did for me as far as being an American. As you notice, I'm donning the, uh, the, the Union Blue, if you will. Uh, I happen to be the president of the Buffalo Soldiers for the state of Oregon. And um, that has some significance because just my little part of history just before we get into my exact and, and the rest of the program is that um, we hear a lot about the emancipation of the slaves but in all due respect, if you had an opportunity to see Glory, the, the movie, whatever, it really was about the fact that African Americans fought for their freedom. It wasn't about the freedom of the slaves, it was about the fact that they were part and parcel of, of basically maintaining what we have here today. And that's, that's really an appreciation that I, I think we have forgotten, so to speak. I'm taking a little bit of time to give you a better feel of what this is all about because I want to personalize this because we're Oregonians here. And, and then hopefully we'll be the jump start because you've heard the old saying, the first frontier and the last frontier. Well, we were the first frontier and then we were the last frontier, so we have to be the first again to kind of get people back on, on tape, okay? So with that, uh, we're gonna go on and begin the program and uh, we're gonna basically go through the regular protocol aspect of it. And we're here visiting the Roadway Inn. We're here at the Roadway Inn. Uh, we're fortunate to, and we're, we basically, we're here because this has a sense of significance. Uh, this was a place here in southeast Portland that was an eyesore, and uh, it just so happened that uh, it, the ministry uh, took on the task of, uh, of solving this eyesore problem, and we're fortunate to be here, and, uh, and what we're going to do, we're going to start off with an invocation, and then we're going to go into um, the singing of the national anthem after the Pledge of Allegiance to the Flag, and then we'll get right into Mike Zach, and who will talk to, about his book back to the basic for the Republican Party, and then we'll field some questions from the audience, and uh, I think you're going to really, really enjoy this. So sit back, have a good cup of coffee, cup of tea, and do enjoy. Okay? Good. With that, Pastor, will you come up? Well, Bruce asked me just to kind of address you just a little bit, and welcome. We want to say we're glad that you're here. Uh, our church purchased this place back in June of 2004 and helped clean it up. And uh, it was really known as one of the largest distribution centers for crack cocaine and methamphetamines. And, uh, but uh, I'll tell you, when the church works together and when we work together, great things transpire. And so we were able to kind of clean this up and we just want to welcome you guys and say that we're really glad that you're here. Uh, as we're here today, we also want to remember uh, that we are here as a free nation, and a lot of people have gone forward to, to pave the way for that freedom. And as a nation today, we are thinking about the King family and uh, Coretta Scott King, who passed away. And, and we, we want to remember that a lot of people have gone before and paved the way. We're here today because of those people. 
And uh, as we get ready to pray, I just want to say thanks again for being here. And uh, we just really believe that great things are ahead of us. And Bruce, thank you so much for coming here. And uh, we're praying for you and just praying for uh, great things to transpire. Hey, let's pray together, shall we? Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace and we thank you for your love. We thank you most of all that we live in a nation that we can say is free. And today we remember that a lot of people have gone ahead of us and we pray for the King family. We pray that you will be close to them. We pray, Father, that, that in this great nation we will realize that so many people have paved the way. And as we're here, we pray for Bruce and just the, the campaign that he's on. And we just ask, Father, that you will bless this. We pray that you will uh, guide and direct us. We pray for wisdom. We pray that you will indeed direct our steps. And again, we thank you for the privilege of being able to be here this day. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now we'll have the Harmons to come up and lead us through the Pledge of Allegiance of the Flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in the gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the program again like I said we uh, we've got in our midst uh, Mike Zach uh, with back to the basics for the Republican Party and and I'm really excited about uh, about this because I in fact my wife Norma and I are going to join in, in in an effort if you will to really get this message across because it's so so important uh, th this world has gotten very very small as you know we've got conflicts all over the all over the world for that matter and I've always maintained that this country was the glue if you will and it's very, very important that we do it. So in order to get back to that, we need to know about this history, and hopefully what Mike is going to do with us today, he's going to talk to this history, and if he has enough time, he's going to bring us up to date. He's going to also talk about uh, uh, the impact that the Rep Republican Party, that's the partisan side of this piece. It's kind of interesting. We've got two major parties, and, and one takes credit for the, for the minority effort, and the other one doesn't. But the one who doesn't are the ones who actually or it should be taking the credit and the like. But when it all comes down to the bottom line, it's all about Americanism. <laughs> and this history needs to, we need to talk about this piece. So Mike, would you please come up here and let's welcome him to Oregon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And hopefully I'm not going to be a distraction, but the, he's going to talk about the uniform, right Mike? Absolutely. All right. It's a great uniform. Well, thank you very much, Bruce, and thanks everyone for attending. Um, it's a real honor to be among so many patriotic Americans. Um, I'll start off a little about the book. I wrote Back to Basics for the Republican Party because I felt that Republicans would benefit tremendously if they only knew and appreciated the history of their party. Uh, they really don't as a party. And it occurred to me the reason why, I think, is because Republicans have, people have grown up reading history books written by Democrats. And Democrats tend to write even the history of the Republican Party from a Democrat point of view. And if we Republicans knew our story better, we, that information would be power. And we could use that to, in today's politics, to advance our Republican agenda in Oregon and across the country. 
So again, it's called Back to Basics for the Republican Party. For your listeners, viewers out there, it's got a website in the back, www.republicanbasics.com. So at republicanbasics.com, you can read about the book. And one last thing personally about myself, I give speeches to Republican organizations around the country, Lincoln Day dinners and state conventions and so forth, and uh, my email is on the website. So um, let me talk a little about how the Republican Party began and uh, as sort of a way to start this uh, event off. In the 1850s, there were two main parties, the Democratic Party and the Whig Party, and they were divided over economic policy, basically. But by the 1850s, the main question before the country was, is this, as Lincoln said, are we going to be all slave or all free? And the Democratic Party, frankly, became the pro-slavery party. And history books do not mention that very much, but they were so pro-slavery that people called them the, de the Slavocrat Party. So the Slavocrats, the Democrats, and uh, opponents in the Whig Party basically fell apart because they tried to compromise on slavery. Well, out of that void grew the Republican Party, which was a coalition of anti-slavery groups across the country. And very soon, within months, the Republican Party became a national party and a contender for the White House. Um, an interesting point is, and sad, really, the year 2004 was the 150th anniversary of the Republican Party. And to my knowledge, almost nothing was done to celebrate the GOP's own 150th anniversary. And um, in two weeks is the uh, um, anniversary of the first national meeting of the Republican Party. And again, to my knowledge, nothing is being done about that. So that's why Back to Basics for the Republican Party is so important. And that's why I appreciate support from people like Bruce, because they, uh, they agree with my message that Republicans need to know and appreciate their heritage. Now, key to what the Republican Party has achieved over the um, s century and a half is civil rights. Nearly all civil rights achievements, I would say, legislatively by this country were achieved by the Republican Party. Um, the 13th Amendment, freeing the slaves, the 14th Amendment, extending the Bill of Rights to the states, and the 15th Amendment for voting rights were all Republican initiatives that were enacted despite fierce opposition from the Democratic Party. And um, uh, as people know, the, the ninth, they should know, not only were we talking about the 1964 Voting right, Civil Rights Act, but there was the 1957 Civil Rights Act, that, which was a Republican initiative. The 1960 Civil Rights Act, the, um, the Republican administra Eisenhower administration sending federal troops to enforce the federal court's ruling of uh, integrating the public schools, Republican initiative. More Republicans supported the... The, re the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act were supported by the Republicans much more than were the Democrats. And yet, today, we see that Republicans have, very, ha have lost a lot of, um, have very little uh, support among the African-American commu community. And I would argue the, re the fundamental reason for that is Republicans themselves don't know and don't care about the Republican Party's heritage. So the key to great, to more effective outreach and to achieving the moral high ground on all issues is to appreciate the heritage of the Republican Party. So um, this month we're honoring um, Abraham Lincoln, and I'll talk about Lincoln in a minute, a few interesting Oregon connections. But uh, let's talk about Martin Luther King for a minute. Um, the federal judge, for instance, who ruled in favor of Rosa Parks and overturned the blacks in the back of the bus law was a Republican federal judge appointed by Republican President Dwight Eisenhower. Never makes it into the history, into the history books or the media. And the fundamental reason for that is even the Republican Party doesn't know and doesn't care. So we can't really blame the media or the history books when we, as par uh, or the party leadership, doesn't care about that. Um, Let me back up and talk about Abraham Lincoln, and I'll lead off with two interesting Oregon connections to Abraham Lincoln. Number one, Abraham Lincoln was offered the post of go governor of the Oregon Territory in 1848. As a congressman, he had worked for the Whig candidate, Zachary Taylor, who was elected, and uh, he was offered the job, you know, a political plum of being territorial governor of Oregon. And um, 
this is before the railroad and so forth, and Mary Todd did not want to go. But also, even then, Oregon was known as a Democrat state, even then. And Lincoln realized that it would be, he wouldn't be able to convert that into a power base in Oregon to become a U.S. senator or, so, or even a, an elected state governor once it became a state. So uh, he declined, basically, because even then it was a Democrat state. Um, another interesting Oregon connection is there's Baker County in western Oregon, in Baker, town of Baker. And Baker is named after Edward Baker, U.S. senator, Republican senator from Oregon, who resigned from the Senate when the Civil War broke out to fought in fight in the Union Army, this, uh, wearing this uniform, or the, this sort of uniform. He was killed shortly thereafter in Lincoln, and he had been a friend of Lincoln's in, from Illinois. And in fact, they were such good friends. Lincoln was such a good friend of Edward Baker that he named his second son Eddie after Edward Baker, that Baker County in, in Oregon is named after. So uh, very many uh, uh, historical points of information that the Republican Party could be using in all sorts of ways, even today, to spark interest in the Republican Party and achieve what I would say is the uh, initiative and the moral high ground that really belongs to the Republican Party. So, Bruce, I was wondering if you had any uh, comments or uh, questions at this point? Well, why don't we start off with maybe uh, the whole issue of reparation. I mean, all right. we, we today are sort of confused. W where, did, where did the word come from? How did, how did all right. it, what was its origin? Like? All right. On the book here, um, we've got Abraham Lincoln and Ronald Reagan as sort of bookends for the party. But I also have two other interesting gentlemen, and the reason they're s s sort of obscure today, but they shouldn't be, and that's why they're on the cover of the book. Briefly, this man is named Charles Sumner. He was um, a U.S. senator from, Republican senator from Senate from Massachusetts who was beaten almost to death on the floor of the U.S. Senate by a Democrat congressman for speaking against slavery. Um, this man here rivals Abraham Lincoln as the greatest Republican who ever lived, and his name was Thaddeus Stevens. And uh, he was the majority leader during the Civil War and Reconstruction. And it was his idea, the phrase, 40 acres and a mule, was his. So 40 Acres and a Mule is actually a Republican initiative. No, it never uh, was passed into law, but partly was because the strong opposition from the president at the time, who was a Democrat. History books also somehow don't get around to mentioning the fact that the president, who after Abraham Lincoln, for the first four years of the Civil War, was a Democrat, Andrew Johnson. So Thaddeus Stevens came up with the idea of 40 Acres and a Mule, and what he wanted to do was transform the South and get rid of the feudal system of slavery and uh, turn it into a market, modern market economy. And key to that was breaking up these slave plantations. They were huge. So I remember reading somewhere like 15,000 people, families owned almost all of the land in, 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 this, in the pre-Civil War South and on which lived, well, the good land at least, and which la worked all these slaves. And he said, Legally, his point was, well, these people have all rebelled against the government, and so they get what we're going to do is they're going to pay for it by, loot, by leaving, by the government will confiscate all but 200 acres, which would still leave them big farms, and give that land to the former slaves and to the free whites, by the way, because there were a lot of p poor people, poor white people who had nothing as well, and they were all going to get, the blacks were going to get it for free, and the whites were going to get it at a, at a very cheap cost. And his proposal was actually, Thaddeus Stevens' proposal was actually 40 acres and $50, but, um, it, which was actually several mules. The reason the mule came in was uh, a General Sherman, after the Civil War, uh, there was a lot of um, unused land uh, in the Carolinas, and uh, his idea was to parcel it out to um, the ex-slaves there, and he would give them mules and 40 acres. And... Uh, that was actually implemented, and the black community in the Carolinas was beginning to uh, be self-sufficient. But then that whole program was overturned by Democrat President Andrew Johnson, and uh, all that land was returned to the slave, to the former rebels who were their slave masters just a few years before. So people who today s complain, where's my 40 acres of mule? They should go over to the DNC headquarters and <laughs> <laughs> complain. So um, that's where 40 Acres and Mule, that's how it happened, and that's how it, never, that's how it began, and that's how it was stopped by the Democrats. Another point is that uh, Michael was very instrumental and very involved in putting this calendar together.
Would you mind going sure. to one? Just how do you get the, how did you get to that particular? Thing? All right. And maybe highlight some of the things. Of course. Um, Back to Basics for the Republican Party is very well uh, read on Capitol Hill. Lots of people in the administration at the RNC and on, in the, in the um, congressional leadership have, have read Back to Basics for the Republican Party. Uh, Justice Clarence Thomas cited it in the Supreme Court case, which was very good. But one of the most influential people who read it and loved it was former U.S. Representative Ch Chris Cox, who's now chairman of the SEC. And he's a big history buff, and he read the book and invited me to lunch, and we talked about it, and then he hired me at what he ran, his committee was the policy committee, and he hired me to write the 2005 Republican Freedom Calendar, which says, celebrating a century and a half of civil rights achievement by the party of Lincoln. And every day of the year, it's got beautiful, this is the first African-American state governor, Republican, of course. Um, here's one. The statue atop the U.S. Capitol building is called, uh, um, it's called Freedom. And that statue was actually made, the actual bronze statue was made by a former slave who had been emancipated by the Republican Party's uh, D.C. Emancipation, District of Columbia Emancipation Act. So uh, that actual monument, now again, think, you think, well, so what? Think of it, if a Demo if the, think of this had been created by a Democrat, we would never hear the end of it. But because the Republican created it, it's like it never happened. I'll give you another little example. As I mentioned in the book, Memorial Day was created by a Republican U.S. Senator and vice presidential candidate. And you say, well, okay, so long time ago. Think of if a Democrat had, f had created Memorial Day. You'd never hear the end of it. Every year would be the DNC presents Memorial Day. <laughs> it sounds silly, but that's, think of, we wouldn't go quite to that extreme, but think of if we appreciated our heritage better, what we could, what, what, what we could do with that every single year. So uh, this is every day of the year, a Republican civil rights achievement, and it's got uh, some great quotes in here. Um, we've all heard of the 13th Amendment banning slavery, but I actually quote it. And then I say, well, who wrote it? The 13th Amendment written by Senator Lyman Trumbull, Republican of Illinois. So the, the, it didn't just come down from the sky. A Republican member of Congress wrote the 13th Amendment. The 14th Amendment, written by the, the key section of it, written by Republican U.S. Representative John Bingham of Ohio, wrote it. It didn't just pop out of, into existence from nowhere. Republicans wrote the actual words. Um, so this is every single day of the year, a Republican civil rights achievement, and I wrote a very nice history of the party, which begins just one half of one sentence. <sighs> to stop the Democrats' pro-slavery agenda, anti-slavery anti activists founded the Republican Party. Now right there, that, you can pretty much stop reading. That, that power, that's powerful, and that's the sort of thing that we should be highlighting over and over and over. Uh, We've got many, many uh, Republican heroes here. We've got uh, Susan B. Anthony, Republican hero. How's that? History books sometimes mention the fact that she was arrested for voting in 1872, which she did, she did and she was. What they never mention is, well, who did she vote for? And the answer is, quote, the straight Republican ticket. So Susan B. Anthony, GOP, and we just don't use that information. Here's Booker Washington, yes, civil rights hero and educational advocate, but also Republican activist, just like all of you. Uh, the first U.S. Hispanic U.S. Senator, Octaviano Laranzolo of New Mexico, in the 1920s. Um, this is the first Republican, this is the first Hispanic governor in the United States. Um, Romualdo Pacheco from California in the 1870s. Went on to be a U.S. representative and then ambassador. So solid Republican, first Hispanic governor. We just something don't use that information. Some, something that uh, uh, African Americans have yeah. always cringed about uh -huh. was the KKK. Ah, yes. And I've always Let's talk about the KKK. Uh, and, and we've always felt that they were a bunch of conservative Republicans. Yeah. Uh, give us the facts, will you? All right. The Ku Klux Klan. Uh, 
began in the South. Well, first off, you have to remember um, the Democrat, the solid South, which we was used to do, the Democratic Party, didn't begin in the Reconstruction era, which is uh, what history books will tell you is resentment against the Republican Party. Wrong. Solid, the, Repu the Democratic Party, the South was solidly Democrat from since the 1850s, well before the Republican Party even really began. And uh, an example, in the 1860 presidential, I'm getting to the Ku Klux Klan, in the 1860 presidential election, I bet I'm going to ask a question here, and I, I, I bet you all know the answer. How many votes did Abraham Lincoln get in the South in the 1860 presidential election? I bet you all know the answer. Zero. Lincoln got zero votes. And sometimes you'll say, well, he wasn't on the ballot. No, that's not true. There was no ballot in the, 18th, by the, 18, in the 1860s. You just run in and you voted for whoever you want. Zero people voted for the Republican presidential nominee in the South. Few in Western Virginia, which became West Virginia, but aside from that, zero. Um, after the Civil War, the Democrats, remember they're all Democrats, the Democrats of the South felt they had to oppose the Republican Party's freedom initiative in the post-Civil War South, and there sprang up many um, terrorist organizations to uh, fight the Republicans and prevent the Republicans from achieving freedom for African Americans. And there were groups like the Red Shirts and the uh, Knights of the White Camellia and the Knights of um, the White Circle, I think. But the most important and the most popular one was the Ku Klux Klan. And uh, uh, all Democrats, every single one of them. And uh, so when you see history books spin those guys as conservatives and Republicans, they're lying. They were all Democrats, all of them. In fact, um, um, the Ku Klux Klan assassinated a U.S. member of Congress while he was running, for, while he was speaking, at a, uh, running for re-election from Arkansas. The history books never quite mention that, do they? Um, history, uh, nearly all, a very interesting study, nearly all victims of lynching in the South whose voter registration could be established were Republicans. So there's very much an anti-Republican aspect to the Ku Klux Klan as well as anti-black. And again, Democrats, all of them. So um, don't let the history books spin those guys into, into Republicans or conservatives. They were Democrats. One other, one other question I'd like to ask. When did African Americans participate in, in Congress? Yes. After the, um, well, the, after the Civil War, the Republican Party made sure that they could, African Americans could vote and could st hold for, uh, stand for office, run for office. And uh, um, the, for instance, the man who replaced Jefferson Davis in the U.S. Senate in Mississippi was an African American named Hiram Revels. He had been an AME pastor in um, Baltimore and moved south during the war and became a U.S. Senator from, from Mississippi. Uh, there were quite a few um, African Americans in, uh, in the U.S. House of Representatives as well, and I have them all, all uh, honored here in the calendar. Um, one of them, interestingly enough, was um, uh, John Lynch, who uh, was a former slave who became a U.S. Representative, a Republican. <coughs> and in 1884, he was honored. He was made chairman of the Republican National Convention as late as 1884 in honor of this man. And an interesting point, which I mentioned in the book, is that uh, one of the men who spoke in his favor of the nomination of chairman of the convention was a 23-year-old Theodore Roosevelt. So there's a nice, beautiful connection between the Civil War and the Reconstruction era, and then handing it off to the next generation, uh, Theodore Roosevelt. And Theodore Roosevelt Jr., by the way, Theodore Roosevelt Sr. was a Republican activist as well from New York, uh, and uh, appointee of, uh, of Rutherford Hayes. So um, there were other Republicans. Uh, as I mentioned, the, Republican, the first Republican governor was an African-American governor of, of Louisiana. He had a very interesting name of Pinchback. His last name was Pinchback. And, um, and I'll find his picture here somewhere. There he is, Pinckney Pinchback, and uh, um, Republican governor. And uh, we, we Republicans, um, many, many dozens and dozens of state legislators and, uh, and mayors, and uh, basically, as soon as the Republican Party lost its 
control over the South, the Democrats reasserted themselves and out they went. Uh, there was one Republican, African American Republican, who held on to office in Western North Carolina until 1901, but he was pretty much the exception. The Democrats pretty much um, uh, removed or kept blacks from voting, and so these African Americans weren't didn't weren't elected, and that was the end of them until the black presence in politics in the South until the 1960s, and that was again due to the Democratic Party. Okay, what we'll do now is that when we take questions from the floor, and Mike, if you don't mind, you can still sit down, and then you could just repeat the question. Yeah, you know, fine. Okay? okay, that's fine. Let's go ahead. Amen. Amen. We have a Amen. Yes, sir. A little point in time in which the um, Republican Party lost the persona of being the leader of the civil rights movement, and the, the Democratic Party, as far as the popular membership of African Americans, uh, asserted itself as the uh, party of the... Democrats in the 1960s, they were able to sweep away the history and present the Democrats as the champions of civil rights and Republicans because they had forgotten their heritage, weren't able to counteract that very effectively. So um, it's our fault that we lost the um, the, the high ground. And uh, go ahead. Okay, you have another question, sir? It came to be a, a stigma attached to what we call radical Republicans, as if they were somehow different from the interests of the United States of America. Yeah, right. But in truth, the radical Republicans began before the turn of the century. Right. Could you tell us a little bit about that the background? Republicans. The radical Republicans, of course. They're the hero <laughs> I'm giving it away. The radical Republicans are the heroes of this book. Uh, uh, back to basics for the Republican Party. And these two gentlemen here, Sumner and Thaddeus Stevens, were radical Republicans. Remember, history books are written by, almost all except this one, are written by Democrats. So they spin the radical Republicans as somehow villains and so forth. It's absurd. During the Civil War and afterward, there were different wings of the, de of the Republican Party. Some people were, they were all anti-slavery. Some were conservative, some had a conservative policy. We'll just contain slavery and it'll eventually go away. Others were moderately against slavery. Others were radically, other Republicans were radically against slavery. They wanted freedom now. So I ask, and I say in the book, if you were alive then, would you have been conservatively against slavery? Would you have been moderately against slavery? Or would you have been radically against slavery? And the answer is you would have been radically against slavery. You should have been. You would have been a radical Republican too. They talk about a, a harsh policy that they wanted for the South. Number one, the president was a Democrat. So whatever the Republicans could harshly do to anybody is ridiculous when the Democrats held the White House. Number two, this guy here, for instance, Thaddeus Stevens, who's regarded as the worst of the villains, was anti-capital punishment. I'm not, pro I'm not saying whether I agree with him, but that stance of his hardly applies to a man c who was like a vengeance-crazed villain. They didn't, want ven they didn't want personal vengeance against anyone. They wanted the South transformed and improved. The man who, was, who had been fiercely, ca had been vociferously calling for the, F for the Confederates to be hanged was Andrew Johnson, the Democrat who became president. When you read about history books, when Lincoln was assassinated, how shocked and terrified Southern Confederates were. That's true. History books spin them, spin it as, oh, they were afraid of the radical Republicans. When again, the president was a Democrat, so what a bunch of congressmen could do to them when the president was a Democrat is absurd. But they were afraid of, they, when Lincoln was killed, they were afraid for their lives because Andrew Johnson was calling for them to be hanged. He said the very first guy he, when he was going to get a hold of was Andrew was Jefferson Davis and hang him. That was Andrew Johnson, not the Republicans. They were terrified because, oh my God, the guy who had been calling for them to be executed was now president. Well, they had reason to be terrified. But and once he became president, he totally changed course. But the radicals were the ones of 40 acres and a mule. They were the ones who enacted the 14th Amendment, wrote the 14th Amendment. They were the ones who passed the 15th Amendment. The Thirteenth Amendment banning slavery, all of that was they were radically against slavery. Would they were the group. Thirteenth Amendment was banning slavery. And that was written by the Republicans. The Fourteenth Amendment was extending the Bill of Rights to the states because after the Thirteenth Amendment was passed, the Democrats in the South said, All right, well fine, there's no legal slavery, that's fine, okay, great. We can't buy and sell black people anywhere. But we will treat them miserably with no civil rights at all. So they're basically slaves. 
And then the Republicans said, no, 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 we're going to pass the 14th Amendment, basically in extending basic civil rights of the co U.S. Constitution to th at the local level. You can't do this to them. You can't do that to them. They said, fine. They got around that, and they said, well, all right, we can't quite treat them like slaves, but they're sure not going to vote. So the Republicans passed the 15th Amendment, saying, yes, they can vote. They got around that as well. But these were, m all three were measures to overcome Democrat resistance to civil rights for African Americans. And they were all done by the radi radically radical Republicans. You know, so they're the, they're, they're in a lot of ways, they're the greatest of American heroes. And the, civil r the history books spin those guys as, as villains. It, 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 it's absurd. And that, I think, fundamentally, is why Republicans are afraid of, of, of commemorating their heritage. It's because of the lies they themselves believe because of what Democrat professors told them. Yes, sir. Uh, you were talking about the radicals. What was their relationship to the abolitionists? And were the abolitionists uh, Christians? Where did they get their feelings about slavery being morally wrong? Well, you you repeat the yes. Uh, what, were the, what was the relationship of the radicals to the abolitionists and their feeling about slavery being morally wrong? One can't oversimplify and classify people as either radicals or, or moderates or conservatives. There was a spectrum of feeling. Um, the word abolitionist uh, before the Civil War meant, again, people who wanted slavery freed, freed, the slaves freed immediately, and that legally was impossible, constitutionally impossible, as even Lincoln admitted. Um, but as the Civil War began, a lot of the Republicans said, well, the, the Democrats of the South are not going to rebel against the United States government, shoot U.S. soldiers, hang people for, for, for owning American flags, and then claim constitutional protection for their slaves at the same time. They can't have it both ways. They've rebelled. They've fo they have given up their allegiance to the country. And guess what? They therefore give up their claims to own other people. That was the, radical re that was the Republicans' radical solution to this. And so abolitionism sort of merged into the Republican main started to become re mainstream Republican policy. And then after the war, slavery was officially abolished, as I said, but the Democrats wanted to keep them as still as like serfs bound to the land. And the Republican, now abolitionism was no longer the issue because they were legally free, but then the, uh, the same tendency was now we want them to be really free. And that became the radical Republican agenda. They were... Uh, uh, yes, they, there was a quite a, of, a, of a Christian moralistic uh, a tendency within the Republican Party. Um, many of the early African-American leaders of the Republican Party were ministers, and like Hiram Revels and a number of others were ordained ministers. And uh, um, Charles Sumner was quite, uh, in his speeches, had a lot of religious imagery and, and, and uh, background of what, why he was against slavery. Uh, Thaddeus Stevens as well, uh, and not other radicals as well. Let me talk about the radicals versus Lincoln. History books, again, written by Democrats, will go on and on and on about the fights, quote, between Lincoln and the radical Republicans as if they were the enemy. They were all in the same party. Lincoln barely talked to Democrats, barely gave the time of day to Democrats. It's very hard to find anything that he ever said to Democrats or met with Democrats. He was very, very hardline partisan Republican president. So the, f the disputes that he had with other Republican leaders were all intramural squabbles. They were not titanic policy struggles. The enemy for the all Republicans was the Confederacy and the Democratic Party. So we have to keep that in mind when history books talk about Lincoln having policy disputes with these men. They were, po they were disputes over timing, not ultimate goal. Lincoln had a war to run. He had to keep the moderates on his team. He had to not anger the Democrats too much in order to keep some of them on, his, on the Union war effort. But he shared exactly their ultimate goal as to what he wanted. They, they were the, they were the um, Frederick Douglass, for instance, said, criticized Lincoln very much for being too slow on things. But of course, Lincoln had other things to worry about. But Frederick Douglass said later, he said, you know, in retrospect, he said Lincoln was never a s more than a step or two behind us and sort of gave him a nod to, you know, Lincoln being the master of timing. You, he couldn't call for immediate action on everything or he wouldn't have got it done. 
So Lincoln, in fact, shortly before Lincoln was killed by a Democrat. Um, who, who was that? John Wilkes Booth, oh. the actor. Uh, uh, Lincoln was moving very strongly toward the, quote, radical position. Shortly, months before, in the months before he uh, was assassinated, he had uh, replaced some of his cabinet mem uh, secretaries with more radical Republicans. Uh, the 13th Amendment was a radical Republican initiative, not just Republican, but it was of the radical wing, and Lincoln was the one who insisted on it being part of the platform for 1864. So he was getting closer and closer to their position just because he was one of them, but he had to move a couple steps behind them in order to get it done properly. So we cannot overemphasize the policy. We can't overemphasize the disputes between these men. Yes, ma'am. Even back then, Democratic actors were taking pot shots at the country. Second, <laughs> um, you talked about the Ku Klux Klan, and I think it's highly ironic, and I would like your, your take on this, the only member of the United States Congress, in fact a senator, who was quite active in the Ku Klux Klan is a Democrat and right. keeps getting voted back in by the constituents who should be horrified at his actions. Can you address that problem? Well, uh, I g oh yeah, well, talk about the, the, the I've been asked to ask address the question of the Ku Klux Klan and, and the Democrats opposed, the f as she said, taking pot shots at the country and then uh, mentioning the fact that the Ku uh, Senator Robert Byrd was a Klansman. And not only a Klansman, he was a Klegel, which was a recruiter for the Ku Klux Klan. So, uh, and yet the Democrats call him still the conscience of the Senate. And for the Democrats, that's probably true. Uh, so Robert Byrd, yeah, uh, was a recruiter for the Ku Klux Klan. Um, Franklin Roosevelt appointed a former Klansman to the U.S. Supreme Court. So think about this. The Democrats are giving, gave Judge Alito and Judge Roberts an incredible going over in opposition, yet had no problem with a Klansman being nominated and confirmed to the U.S. Supreme Court. So um, we, now, we have to m remember that the, the Klan has had several evolutions and changes, and to be fair, there were, in the 1920s or so, it did sort of blend and it sort of in, uh, infiltrated in some places the Republican Party as well in the 1920s. But it is correct. But uh, in Indiana, for one, uh, the Klan had uh, quite a lot of influence within the Republican Party. But uh, when I'm talking about the Klan as uh, in its ultra-violent tendencies, when it really had a tr terrible effect on the country was in the post-Civil War era when it was completely Democrat. Um, so. I don't understand how the Democrats can call a former Klansman the conscience of the U.S. Senate, but they did and they still do. So, yes, sir. I know that the uh, South had what was known as a uh, slave code, and uh, in that code, uh, various uh, peoples were treated as property, right. and uh, various other demeaning things happened to them as a result. And uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, issued the Emancipation Proclamation, what, 1863? Mm -hmm. And uh, that was when people of the South said that the Lord must be against the Union Army because the South has defeated them in battle after battle after battle until Vicksburg and Gettysburg when the right. war began to turn. Right. And <coughs> there was no mention of Heavenly Father's involvement in that by the South from that point on. But when the great emancipator, Abraham Lincoln, was assassinated, the president who succeeded him was Andrew Johnson. We had what was known as no longer the slave code. That was gone because of the Civil War and the results of efforts to free the South. But now we had a black code. Right. What's the difference between those two? Well, here's one for you. The very first gun control laws in this country ever were enacted by the Democrats of the South prevent forbidding black people from owning guns. First gun control laws were to keep guns out of the hands of black people, passed by the Democratic Party. Um, there was very little difference. Um, immediately after the Civil War, because Lincoln was assassinated and the Democrat was in the president, now let's back up a little about Andrew Johnson for a second. Andrew Johnson was the only member of the U.S. Senate 
from the South to stay loyal to the country. He was very much a partisan Democrat. He was Andrew Jackson Johnson. And he was from the hills of Tennessee and had born in the hills of no South North Carolina. So he had very much a resentment against the plantation aristocracy. But he was still a Democrat, and he, he loathed black people. There's some uh, things that he said about Frederick Douglass, for instance, who just peeled the bark off a tree. And uh, um, Charles Sumner once went in to meet with President Andrew Johnson to ask about um, plead on behalf of African Americans. And when he got up, he noticed that the whole time Andrew Johnson had been using Sumner's hat as a spittoon. It had been around the corner of the hat of the desk, and he had been spitting tobacco juice into Sumner's hat the whole time. That's what this Democrat thought of African Americans. Um, so as soon as Lincoln is killed, the, uh, the Andrew, Jackson, Andrew Johnson had no problem with the Democrats of the South reasserting control over the over the African Americans. And when we talk about Reconstruction. It's important to remember, Reconstruction, Republican Reconstruction, didn't even begin for two years after the Civil War ended. For two years after the Civil War ended, the former rebels were still in charge. It was finally the Republicans were so outraged at what the Democrats were doing after the Civil War that they passed over the jo Jack Johnson's veto Reconstruction legislation to just pushed him aside and said the Republicans will, will save the black people now. Will, will control the South and, and save African Americans. And uh, that, so re Reconstruction didn't begin for two years afterward. So during those two years, yes, the, the Democrats of the South uh, passed black codes to replace the slave codes. Blacks couldn't be out at night. They could only work as in field hands or as limited number of occupations. Uh, yes, they couldn't be bought and sold, but their movements and their rights were severely curtailed. They could be bought and sold in a sense that uh, any black could be uh, arrested uh, and, and sentenced to prison for uh, vagrancy. And they said, well, we're not going to put him in prison. We'll just rent him out for a year to this plantation guy. Poof, he's a slave again. It was outrageous what they were doing. And that's when the Republican Party got so upset at the black codes that they began Reconstruction. Yes, sir? It seems so odd. Yes, what sir. President Lincoln worked so hard to achieve and gave his life for mm -hmm. was destroyed at the turn of a, a hat by the Democratic Party who refused to acknowledge the will of the people. That's right. And you mentioned the Emancipation Proclamation and the Heavenly Father. Charles Sumner added a, just a little bit of the Emancipation Proclamation and added the, the, the appeal to God at the end. And Lincoln realized that he had overlooked that. And it was Charles Sumner who added the appeal to the benefit, to the blessings of Almighty, Almighty God in the Emancipation Proclamation. And uh, it's really true. So it, wasn't, it was sort of a Republican team effort in a way. Yes, sir? Could you mention about uh, Douglas going to the White House after the 64 inauguration? T talk about the, the um, uh, Frederick Douglass going to the, 19, to the 1864 inaugural ball. And I mentioned that in the book, Back to Basics of the Republican Party. Um, yeah, he link, uh, Frederick Douglass came to the inaugural ball and was the policemen, the soldiers, guards were keeping him out because he was black. And Lincoln heard about it. One of his friends saw it and he went to Lincoln. And Lincoln was on the receiving line and Lincoln sent word to have Frederick Douglass admitted. And Lincoln and then walk, Douglass walked in and this is very public. There are hundreds and hundreds of people around and Lincoln said, here comes my friend Douglass and shook his hand. And, and, uh, and asked Douglas, Frederick Douglass what he thought of the inaugural address. So to us it sounds trivial, but that remember just a few years before, black people were regarded by the Democrats as the slaves and subhuman, and here he is welcoming his friend Frederick Douglass, a black man. His, my, here comes my friend. Ve very calculated words. Yes, sir. And Booker T. Washington, yes. you can tell us about. Yes, yes there is. Um, one of the very, when, when Teddy Roosevelt became president, Republican. One of the very first things he did was invite uh, Booker Washington to dinner at the White House. And uh, the Democrats of the South were so outraged at that that uh, several sta legislatures, state legislators, legislatures passed resolutions condemning him. And there were protests and, and just 
awful reaction, and they had been discussing reviving the Republican Party in the South. So remember, Frederick Doug, uh, Booker Washington, Republican activist, but the Democrats were so outraged at, at the President of the United States inviting a black man to dinner that some people, some Democrats even demanded that the President throw away, discard whatever uh, China and Civil War the man had used. It was just outrageous. You don't read about that much in history books because, again, that was Democrats protesting respect for a black man. Let me get one question, one more last question. Yeah. And that is, uh, spend a couple minutes about the uh, those those African Americans that participated in the Civil War. Yes, sir. And besides the fact that they also the Medical Corps and this, that, and the other. Yes. You mentioned something about Fred Frederick Douglass participating. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm asked. Oh, well, then asked to talk about African American participation in the Civil War. And yes, Bruce made a very good point at the beginning that African Americans, in a, to a large extent, fought for their own freedom. Um, 200, there were 200 and uh, 210,000 African Americans w enlisted in the U.S. Army and U.S. Navy during the Civil War, and most of them were from the South. And um, so I would say almost a quarter, uh, let's say a fifth of, of, of Southern manpower in the Civil War was African American, and they were on the Union side. The uh, 54th Massachusetts from that movie Glory, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen, uh, was, oh, let's, by the way, the 54th Massachusetts was organized by Republican Governor John Andrew of Massachusetts. That was one of his major projects. The 54th and 55th Massachusetts were organized by Republican Governor Andrew, John Andrew. The very first two recruits for the 54th Massachusetts were uh, Frederick Jug Douglass's two sons. And they fought in the war and both survived, actually. Uh, so, and he did that as, uh, the so and sons did that as a, as a, as a, as a, a political statement that af calling on all African Americans to fight for their own freedom. And yes, they fought, they wore the blue, and they, not only that, the U.S. and carried the flag. Now, s inexcusably, even some Republicans or conservatives will talk about this myth of Confederates fighting for the, for the rebels. It, it's ridiculous. None ever were. It was actually against Confederate law. Um, sometimes you'll read in history books, Joe Blo or some, some African Americans served in the Confederate Army. Well, remember, they were slaves. Somebody had to dig the trenches, and somebody had to drive the wagons, and they were slaves that were said, okay, you dig this ditch. Does that make him a member of the Confederate Army? I don't think so. So uh, uh, blacks, African Americans were loyal to the U.S. government and should be revered for it. Well, you know, I, I guess the point I would ask, I guess the last point, and then hopefully you can, you can plug the book again, too, and that is that, uh, uh, one, why are we still fighting the Civil War? Yeah. And secondly, with all this rich history that the Republicans have, and they've been in power at times, you know, where they were basically had the House and the Senate and right. the Republican, you know, President, wh why are we still fighting this war, and why is this divisive? What do you recommend in terms of a solution today? Well... The history of the United States is the story of the Civil War. From the very first days of the Republic until Fort Sumner, the, matter, the major issues of the day were those which led to the Civil War. If you read about the George Washington presidency, what did they actually talk in domestic policy? What were they talking about? They were talking about the issues which decades later would lead to the Civil War. And a lot of people at the time knew it. Um, Today, even to this day, we are, we are living out the epilogue, the, the aftermath of the Civil War. And so key to the Republican Party's seizing the policy initiative in a really st strong way is to appreciate, understand the history of this country, which is to understand the Civil War better, and uh, to appreciate the fact that the Republican Party was the pro-American pro flag party, the pro-U.S. Constitution party, the pro Economic Growth Party, the Pro Civil Rights Party, and you know, we can't effectively carry out our message today if we don't appreciate what we've accomplished in the past. And key to that is a greater appreciation for the Civil War, for the role of the Republican Party in the Civil War. Um, the Back to Basics for the Republican Party is now in a third edition. It's done very well. It sells almost always at, uh, except for Bruce here, I, I haven't had much success in getting publicity, so I'm really glad for this. But it does sell very well at my speeches around the country. I speak to Republican organizations, uh, uh, Lincoln Day dinners and state conventions and so forth. Um, 
What about Democratic organizations? Would you be Would you be willing to speak to Democratic organizations if they would invite you? Sure. Okay. Absolutely. In fact, I, 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 I do speak at some events which are not overtly political, and I tone it down and talk about the evolution of the two-party system in this country and like the origin of the Democrat donkey symbol and the origin of the Republican elephant symbol. Yeah, yeah, I talk about that. The donkey, the Democratic donkey began as a caricature of Andrew Jackson as a jackass. Yeah, and the Democrats over the decades have sort of forgotten that it began as an insult. And that's why, frankly, that symbol isn't very good. You know, it should be a... The Democrats should, you know, a tiger, a lion, a bear, you know, an eagle, something, but a donkey, it's because it was originally an insult. You, know, you do have your history, you, you got the facts, and the book is beautiful. I, I've had the opportunity to read it, and I read it three times, and, and, it, and it's like it's still new when I read it, pick it up again, you know. Well, thank you. I, so, uh, so, again, I, I would encourage uh, everyone to consider purchasing this back to break the basics, because uh, the idea is that what you've heard, there's more to it. There, but it puts it in a chronological order, and so that's what I really right. appreciated what you said. And it is a walking history. <laughs> well, I'll tell you one thing. Someone said about this book, uh, it's like he said it's like a thousand page. It's a history book of a thousand pages, without all, with how do you exactly say, cutting out all the boring stuff, <laughs> just getting to the meat of the issue. Cutting well, not the facts, but cutting out the the, the non-relevant information and boil down yeah, to. That's, it. that's the thing that I enjoyed. And in fact, I. I think I, should, I would introduce this into into the educational system. Wouldn't that be nice? It would be a bad idea to put something like this in. I'll say one last thing about the book. Um, it's it's not only about the Civil War. I go back all the way to the Washington administration and then go forward again um, in stopping at the relevant places along the way. I talk a lot about it, but a lot about economic policy, uh, free silver, and so forth. What, what remember vaguely? What was that all about? Well, that's explained in here in the tariff situation and all. I, it, I talk a lot about economic policy as well. It's amazing how much I've got in, jammed into this book. Uh, it also, this is not Republicans good, Democrats bad, the end. Uh, there's a lot of uh, credit to the good things the Democratic Party has accomplished. And also, um, I'm pretty fair to, Ro Theodore Ro to Franklin Roosevelt in the New Deal, by the way. And um, I also talk about uh, a lot of Republican mistakes. Yes. So there's a lot in this book. Good. Well, look, I think this has been great. I would encourage you to consider purchasing the book, and uh, if you're wanting uh, Michael to come and, and speak before any other group, I think it's going to be fair, as long as you invite me to, <laughs> because it's, he's talking about <coughs> that, see, and so I think it's very important that I'm part of the process. Fair? All right. Okay, and as Larry Dunham said, he, he wanted me to have my weapon, but I don't want to do that until I'm giving it back again. There you go. <laughs> and I won't use it. I won't use it. But again, it's been really a pleasure. My Mike. pleasure. Thank really you, sir. I really appreciate that very much. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.